A sociedade nasceu para defender os interesses da comunidade geofísica brasileira, defender as instituições, defender os, os geofísicos e atuar junto aos órgãos. Petrobras acredita em toda a tecnologia que aponte para um futuro melhor. Robôs que chegam em lugares impossíveis, a Petrobras tem. Supercomputadores e inteligência artificial com respostas instantâneas, também usamos. Realidade virtual para aumentar a eficiência, tudo isso está na Petrobras. Porque assim, com tanta inovação, seremos ainda melhores para você. Good afternoon to all. I, it's a big pleasure for me to introduce Cynthia Ebinger uh, to give you us a talk today. We haven't seen each other for a long time, so it's really good to see you. Thank you, Cindy, for accepting the invitation. Uh, I will give you her biography. Um, she is a PhD in MIT Woods Hole Oceanographic Joint Program in Oceanography, MSc from MIT as well, and a Bachelor in Geology in Duke University. Her, inter her research interests include earthquake seismology, active tectonics, potential field, crustal dynamics, and critical zone imaging for archaeology and geosciences. Um, seeing this talk will be crustal growth and modification by flood, flood and rift magmatism. Cindy Ebinger is from Tulane University, New Orleans, Louisiana, United States. You can talk. Thank you. Cindy, your... Thank you so much, Alberta. You can see I'm not nervous at all. I'm so honored to be giving this presentation and you know, feel like living here in New Orleans, we, we have so much in common, I guess, with, with Brazil um, and um, our Mardi Gras traditions, we hope, are, are renewed in the spring this year. So what I'd like to do is not show you beads and um, other things from, from Mardi Gras, but instead talk about a, a collection of ideas and data sets that inform the structure of magmatic margins and um, flood basalt provinces. So let me share my screen and continue onward. And I just want to say that what I'm presenting is the, a collection of work from so many collaborators from African countries, from the US, from the UK, from South America, uh, and, and many really bright uh, rising stars. My objectives are to explain the distribution and rise of melt through the plate and how the magmatism itself influences rift basin evolution, not just the structure, but also the localization and the, the margin subsidence in some ways as well. This is critical to so many aspects of uh, passive margins and 
our understanding of these margins is even more important as we look to beyond oil and gas to renewable energy uh, from wind farms and others on passive margins. I'm going to use a range of uh, examples from East Africa and Brazil, Eastern passive margin, and if um, just a little snippet of information from North Island, New Zealand, where we can look at back arc rifting and compare with magmatic rifting in East Africa, the active process. I'm going to highlight the progressive rise of magma through the mantle to a sedimentary basin and point out the important role of volatiles, something we hadn't thought about earlier, but they become quite important both in thinking about mantle fluxing to the atmosphere, but also the physical properties of the materials and metasomatic reactions that are occurring that may weaken the plate and predispose it to uh, extension. I'm also towards the end of the talk going to um, present some information that links seaward dipping reflector emplacement to rift evolution. And this is just um, one of many ideas on the evolution of a magmatic rifted margin. And what I'm going to show you is an example of a rift where the basin structure is largely controlled by a large fault, a normal fault system bounding a half bobbin basin that um, is crustal scale and um, that controls the, the style of sedimentation in the basin early on, but then look at the progressive rise of magma as we go to seafloor spreading. Um, well, an aspect of the, this process that becomes very important is even in looking at the societal, or the, a topic of societal relevance, and that is earthquakes along passive continental margins. This is a compilation from Borges et al. in the Journal of Seismology, looking at earthquakes along the southern Brazilian margin. And we see that magnitude six earthquakes, five to six earthquakes occur near, um, inward of the ocean continent boundary beneath these rifted margins and also within the Paraná flood basalt province where Hoberta and I first uh, uh, collaborated in studying the structure of this region. So these comparisons with incipient passive margins and magmatic rifts may offer some insights into the localization of earthquakes and help inform our hazard mitigation in this area. So let me just give a very quick summary of, of the number of processes that are occurring in a magmatic rift zone. We have man, we, far field or uh, body forces are pulling on the plate causing extension that leads to thinning of the crust and mantle lithosphere and a an growing body of observations over the past five to 10 years is indicating that um, mantle lithospheric thinning is greater than the crustal stretching, certainly along magmatic margins and perhaps in, in most rift zones, not margins, sorry, in magmatic rift zones and, in, um, and also in, in amagmatic or weakly magmatic rifts. We have um, in this, in the, where the mantle used to be, we have upwelling uh, asthenosphere that may um, cross the liquid as solidus and generate a small amount of melt. This melt, uh, decompression melting will also be accompanied by volatile release. Uh, that those volatiles and the melt percolation through the mantle lithosphere may also release additional volatiles, primarily CO2 and water, um, and those will cause metamorphic reactions, metasomatic reactions that weaken materials. An example is the metasomatic reaction of olivine that becomes dolomitized in the presence of CO2. And that's an order of magnitude change in the strength of the material. So these, these are the volatiles themselves are important. Um, and then also the rise of magma through the plate, not only does faulting create topography, 
but magma intrusion also creates significant topography within the rift zone. And all of these processes have different time and length scales. So our understanding requires making observations over seconds to millennia or even longer uh, and immediately says teamwork and collaboration and integration. So I'm going to move to the East African rift zone and look at some of the areas here because this very large system spans a, a vast range of different terrains. There are Archean cratons here in orange, with a rift formed around the margins of the craton, but places along the edges are actually rifting thick Archean lithosphere. We have um, a, a, an orogenic belt, the Pan-African here, that includes many oceanic uh, fragments and ophiolite, meta, uh, deeply metamorphosed um, ophiolite sequences in these areas in through here, and also overprints, rift systems, Mesozoic rift systems formed during the breakup of Gondwana. So I, on the right hand side, I'm just going to are some, some facts from this area, but basically say that there isn't, despite earlier information, there's no clear propagation areas here initiated rifting in early Miocene time, the Oligomiocene, roughly synchronous with initial rifting in this part of the rift and in parts of the uh, Gulf of Aden and Southern Red Sea. So um, these areas are clearly younger and there's active extension well into the interior of Africa. But this section uh, includes Earth's youngest passive margin and Earth's youngest flood basalt province, uh, providing unique opportunities. Um, Lithospheric heterogeneities are important, is, is one of the key aspects, uh, uh, key points I wish to make in this talk. And on the left-hand side is an estimate of lithospheric thickness from surface wave uh, analyses. So surface waves provide a velocity structure and assuming uh, geothermal gray, uh, ge uh, geotherms, one can estimate then the lithospheric thickness. This is one of several models and they all show similar patterns of relatively thin lithosphere between North, uh, Northeastern Africa and very thick cratons um, beneath Central and Southern Africa. And, and with exceptions, this is a 20, at least 20 million year old volcanic province that has persisted without much extension for that period of time. On the right hand side is a summary or a summation of seismic moment release over 40 years. Um, and there's a, a deep blue color is the equivalent of a magnitude six earthquake. And what I'm trying to show here is that even into these thick areas of thick lithosphere, we have significant seismic deformation. Um, whereas in these more advanced parts of the rift, we see plate-like deformation with strain localized along in narrow zones. Instead, we have very diffuse deformation in this thick lithosphere, providing opportunities for compare and contrast. So in the er areas of, go back for one second, this is the Southern red block. These are cross sections of seismicity and, and the Southern Tanganyika rift. And um, the color, the size is scaled to magnitude. These are the, um, some of the deepest basins in the world. Water depths are 1500 meters and sediment accumulations are at least six kilometers in some areas. So across these basins, we can see that seismicity occurs along projections of normal faults to the base of the crust or in even the upper mantle and that the nodal planes of well-determined focal mechanisms match with uh, the border fault geometry. This profile is in a long axis profile and the indication here is that between that there are a long axis variations in the depth of seismicity that correlate with a long axis segmentation as well. 
suggesting that these board default systems are, um, you know, control the basin geometry and vary along the strike of the rift. So these are important to say also that there are upper mantle earthquakes in multiple areas. Um, there are some earthquakes down to 53, 55 kilometers depth um, that, uh, that I, I, if you, yeah, anyway, that, that indicate that we're rifting uh, the, even this, this relatively thick lithosphere. Um, now, in I'm going to move to this area here in uh, at the edge of the Tanzania Craton. The Tanzania Craton is at least 170 kilometers thick. There's a quaternary kimberlite over here on the Craton. And over the past 20 million years, there's been a line of carbonatitic volcanoes along the edge of the Craton. Here's the present day location of the rift system, but 20 million years ago, it was nearer to the edge of the Craton. On the right hand side is an, um, a, a summation or a summary of SKS splitting mantle anisotropy patterns. And important to show is that the plate motion northeast vector uh, deviates to rift parallel in the rift zones suggesting that we have channelized flow in between these deeply rooted cratons. And that's probably enhanced by um, dike intrusion. Magma intrusion will contribute to this along axis um, splitting pattern that we see. The sharp change across the craton boundary indicates that it's relatively shallow, consistent with um, a thin zone along the length of the rift system. So this is the Magadi natron rift. The structure, there's a wealth of data in the area. These long lines shown here are of refraction profiles collected in the 70s through the 90s by the CRISP German US collaborative Kenya collaborative projects. Um, and then these are additional. Um, seismometer deployments throughout the region. There are MT profiles in these areas here and here. So a lot of data to help us understand the rift. We also have the only active carbonatitic volcano that erupted in 2007 and eight. Um, and this area has abundant mantle xenoliths, mantle and crustal xenoliths. Imaging of the area in a joint inversion of P wave velocity and density. So here's the P wave velocity anomalies and here are the density anomalies across that perpendicular to the margin shows, um, well, this is the rift. Let me help you out a little. This is the rift at the surface. This is a volcano uh, on the margin of the rift. This is the Mozambican belt, the Pan-African, and over here is the Archean Craton. We can see that there's a, a, almost a divot of um, hot material that, that appears to be eroding laterally into the edge of the Craton in both uh, density anomalies and also in the um, seismic velocity anomalies as well. Let me move to the next figure though to help see, have, you know, integrate all the pieces of information we have from this region. At the surface, my colleagues, collaborators, James Muirhead and Tobias Fisher and others have measured um, soil gas emissions and found large amounts of magmatic CO2 percolating upward along normal fault systems, the border fault systems that detach or, or sole out near these lower crustal intrusion zones. And we know, I'll show you the seismic image, crustal imaging in just a second, but we have CO2 degassing up fault systems from this magmatic CO2, but the actual volumes are large and perhaps larger than the volume of, of, of um, intrusives we image, suggesting that some of the carbon is actually derived from lateral erosion and migration of um, the uh, carbonatized um, lower mantle 
of the Tanzanian craton. And the reason for this is based on numerical simulations of Claire Curry and Yolanta von Reich um, that show that uh, a thick, buoyant, um, refractory uh, Archean mantle will, um, in, a, in a normal, uh, uh, sorry, moving in a normal asthenosphere in a, will um, erode or advect laterally and that some of the material will actually move upward into the zone and could be available to contribute to magnetism. And the volatile uh, contributions would increase the volume of melt in these early stages of rifting. Okay. This may have happened in, in uh, southeastern Brazil during the early rifting of, of Africa and South America. So I'm just summarizing all of this. Um, these are crustal images, the seismicity superposed on seismic velocity anomalies, receiver function, estimates of crustal thinning, which is relatively small, yet magma has risen to levels of uh, roughly 10 kilometers within the basin. And we interpret these as cells. The plan form of these is uh, elliptical and coincides with monogenetic cone complex. There's a magma body that probably feeds Lengai and other volcanoes in the area. And there's a wide range of papers I point you to. My key point here is not the details of all of these studies, but in fact, the implications. We estimate that the over the 7 million years that we get between five and 90 cubic kilometers per kilometer along the rift of new magma intrusion, which is roughly the rate of new crust creation in volcanic arc systems in subduction zones. And this it may mean that there's 20% new magmatic crust in some areas. And this is a 7 million year old rift where most of the extension has occurred in the last 2 million years. So early rifting contributes to the, the um, change in crustal structure and with this um, early rift magnetism. This is a new paper that just came out showing some of these magmatic systems. This is where the, beyond the scope of this, the new study by Miriam Rice, but um, in a new detailed study of Oldonia Langai and Gelai volcano showing the interconnectivity, this is a monogenetic cone complex between the two with sills and um, pressurized magma bodies throughout. This would be where the sill complexes lie. That, um, so this is also where the transition from fault controlled to magmatic controlled extension is occurring. So most of the extension in this area is occurring by magma intrusion. The shape and form of these crustal cell complexes is very similar to that inferred from a magmatic margin or from a sedimentary basins on magmatic margins. This is from McGee and Muirhead, a compilation where we see cells feeding dikes that feed new cells with these fingers and stress concentrations along the edges of the sill complexes that are consistent with all of our seismicity observations in the Natron Basin. So I'm now going to um, jump to the FR depression and look at the last stages of rifting and passive margin development. This is the Southern Red Sea margin that matches then if I take this piece of Yemen and bring it back somewhere to about here, that, that would be roughly the reconstruction of um, the margins prior to extension. What's happened in this part of the rift is that the border for the strain along a half robin has migrated to a zone of magma intrusion and the border fault systems are largely inactive. There, there's some deformation, but it's not accommodating the, um, the rift opening. It may just be flexural accommodation. So we have new segmentation in the rift valley and we know about that segmentation from an episode that, uh, I'll just jump ahead for a second, an episode in 2005 and 2006, where we saw that a magma chamber in a center of a 60 kilometer long segment 
um, fed dikes up, that went both north and south away from the magma chamber and created a rift zone. So let's go back and talk about crustal structure in uh, the southern Afar depression, where we have high velocity, lower crust of thickness, maybe nine to 10 kilometers. Some of this may be may have been added during flood magmatism, but, but it also follows with the rift structure. So 10 kilometers of new igneous material in a rift that's still uh, 30 kilometers thick. Uh, so that's a very large volume of new crustal material. This is MT showing that there are, there's um, melt or connected melt in these areas in here, consistent with the interpretation of ongoing magmatic underplating in across the rift zone. So we take some of those numbers and then move forward to the last stage. We're gonna look at a profile that then, um, these are gravity models and with seismicity superposed, there, this is just showing active extensional deformation along the flexural margin that's bending into the rift here. Um, you can see this, we're moving down into this area and we have areas of um, magma intrusion separated by largely unfaulted and crystalline crust exposed. And then again, an intensely intruded zone suggesting ridge jumps and migrations across the area. This is the presently active area within the rift that uh, where uh, we had so much, um, the 11 dike intrusions at each of at least one meter width, the largest and the first was intruded a dike that was about 10 kilometers high and eight meters wide. Okay. So large volumes of new igneous crust and zones of intensely intruded areas separated by largely unintruded. So strong crustal heterogeneity is created by these migrations and jumps in magnetism. So let's go just take a look at these are some of this is the style of faulting in the youngest part of the rift that is approaching rupture. We can see uh, faults, large offset faults with lava flows along some of those. And then some of this topography is created by the uplift along the sides of dikes. We know that um, we can see what the structure created by that those individual dike intrusions in 2005 and 2006, some of which had um, eruptions or fissural eruptions. This is where the dike actually um, impinged on an existing magma chamber, heated it up and caused a small peralkaline eruption as well. So a dike triggered a, a volcanic eruption in this case. If we look at MT across this incipient C4 spreading center, we can compare MT and then receiver functions, which are reflections from, from earthquakes from the, coming from the bottom of the crust upward. We can see that the, um, here's the MOHO and the MT is showing roughly the crust with magma bodies beneath along two separate profiles. So there's profile one and then profile three is down here. So this would be, this is profile three. Um, we can see that there along this profile, there's magma beneath the rift axis and then another uh, deeper magma body uh, beneath the flank of the rift. And it requires, um, well, the conductivities uh, suggest there's 22% melt, but the constants are based on MORB experiments of conductivity, and these are more alkali basalts, so they're probably overestimates. The anisotropy from electrical anisotropy and seismic anisotropy matches, and, and they're rift perpendicular and suggest that fluid-filled cracks are a, a strong contributor uh, to the anisotropy in these regions as well, consistent with dike intrusion as the process achieving extension. This is just the, um, the surface waves. So you're probably curious about what the Im seismic imaging looks like. And we can see these low velocity zones um, beneath these disconnected uh, um, eruptive centers, magmatic segments. This is the main Ethiopian rift. 
And then this is the Southern Red Sea. There's a big, main Ethiopian rift is opening this way. Whoops, sorry. And the um, uh, Southern Red Sea Rift is opening in a northeast southwest direction with a zone of decoupling between the two of them. So a complex zone in this triple junction. But I, it's this thinning that I wanted to point to, and that allows for localized melt uh, production and then injection feeding the magmatism. So just putting this together again, the seismicity is along a border faults along the margin, they're relatively steep. There's no indication of any detachment fault system. And the interpretation at present is that these are flexural faults that are enabling, uh, accommodating subsidence of this largely uh, mafic, heavily intruded crust. As the heat is lost, the heat transferred via the magmatism is lost to the plate, the plate subsides and it bends. Now this area is a zone of seaward dipping reflector creation where we have dips to the rift uh, on the order of 35 degrees or more, creating a pattern that looks like this. This is just um, sketched in from pieces. There are gaps in between in our imaging. These are the steep faults along the margin. And the active deformation would be here. Here is an abandoned magmatic segment as these rift jumps have happened, occurred throughout the area. On the left-hand side is a model by Buck et al. showing our, that um, a mid-ocean ridge, or sorry, an incipient seafloor spreading center would accumulate or create these seaward dipping reflector sequences um, with it once, if. Uh, with the eventual break in the margin being roughly here. So for South America, this would be South America, this would be Southern Africa. Um, but if the ridge jumps over time, then it can produce a wide variety of geometries, of overlapping geometries of these seaward dipping reflector sequences, consistent with the types of jumps that we can actually document occurring over the past 2 million years in the FR depression. So we think that ridge jumps associated with these localized focused uh, magmatic upwellings are that and interactions between the different rift segments are um, leading to these rift jumps and creating this pattern of seaward dipping reflectors. So let's now go back um, uh, quickly to New Zealand and just say that uh, I know that I'm, I'm approaching 30 minutes. I wanted to just point out an area of back arc rifting within New Zealand, the subduction zone. This is North Island, subduction is occurring beneath this area here. And we have extension connecting to true seafloor spreading in the Havre trough, starting just about here. There's a ridge crest. White Island is was the site of that horrible uh, tragedy with tourists. But in June, May and June 2019, there was a, what we interpret as a sill intrusion in this area here. There were two pulses of magmatism. And there's a seismic profile almost uh, coincident with that uh, swarm that I'm going to show you then. Um, the dikes, or sorry, the dike, here's one, and uh, sill complex here. This is a seismic velocity profile, P wave velocities across the margin here with faster velocities, these being uh, 7.2 kilometers per second, heavily intruded rift zone here. And we can see that the um, dike intrusions are occurring in an area where um, previously interpreted sill complexes um, have, and uh, so we're working to try to correlate and, and compare this margin with the FR margin as well. So as I finish, I'll just look to the South Atlantic magmatic margins with two ion um, two, uh, two physics profiles, the crustal scale profiles across the Argentinian margin, and then the Pelotas Basin here, where we can see these seaward dipping reflector sequences. This is from a recent paper by Lonergan et al. Um, these are the tilted fault blocks from the rift a complex zone in here where we see the ocean continent transition and a blow up of these 
reflector, see we're dipping reflector sequences that fit then with that bucket all model and match with the rift jumps that or the magmatic segment jumps that we see in the Alpha depression. What we would interpret in terms of the crust beneath this area is that it's 20% uh, new igneous material and that a lot of that material was added early in the rift history and that with implications then for the um, thermal history of the passive margin. So I'll just leave this summary slide and to say that magma intrusion aided by volatile release accommodates a very large percentage of the extension and that we have extrusive to intrusive, intrusive to extrusive ratios that are greater than three to one. Um, that, uh, and I just say that also that the but uh, heterogeneities in the lithosphere at all scales are very important. They produce, um, they both localize mantle upwelling and they also create uh, strength heterogeneities that may guide later, later strain. So thank you very much. Thank you, Cindy, for the great talk. Do you have any questions from the audience? I don't know. We are learning how to <laughs> use these mechanisms. <laughs> uh, Cindy. I'm really glad to see you again. I enjoyed very much your talk. And unfortunately, I cannot reach if you have any questions from the audience. Uh, but uh, if we have any questions, I will forward to you. And if you have the chance, you can answer that to us. Yeah, I, I, I welcome the opportunity to discuss science. It's been a tough 18 months, I think, for everyone. And um, if you have questions, please send me emails. I'll try to reply to them within the same day. And I hope that I provoke some discussion here and introduce some bright, really bright young scientists as well. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy, for taking the time to be with us today. Estudar a Terra e poder contar essa história e conhecer essa dinâmica é maravilhoso. A geofísica, de certa maneira, está no dia a dia das pessoas. O movimento que a Terra faz em torno do Sol, a variação de dia e noite, a maré, os tremores que ocorrem na Terra. À medida que está acontecendo um sismo, quais são essas implicações e o que vai acontecer? E a Terra emana essas forças. No Brasil, nós temos uma riqueza de recursos é, minerais, mas a gente não conhece ainda o que está mais de subsuperfície. Né? E isso aí é um campo inesgotável de pesquisa para aumentar a capacidade de riqueza da nação. Qualquer nação que tiver uma geofísica bem forte, ela vai desenvolver com mais qualidade o seu país. A sociedade nasceu para defender os interesses da comunidade geofísica brasileira, defender as instituições, defender os, os geofísicos e atuar junto aos órgãos de governo, seja para conseguir recursos financeiros, seja para é, até protestar contra arbitrariedades. 
realidade brasileira na área de geofísica era uma outra realidade completamente diferente, na medida em que se fazia geofísica ah, na Petrobras para exploração, alguma ah, coisa muito incipiente na área mineral e na área acadêmica ah, não havia sequer ainda um curso de pós-graduação em, em geofísica. O primeiro congresso que foi em 89, um grande grupo de geofísicos determinados né, a tornar a sociedade uma grande instituição e esse primeiro congresso foi o grande marco da SBGF. A Sociedade Brasileira de Geofísica ela atua fortemente no sentido de promover a geofísica no Brasil, então ela é responsável pela realização de congressos internacionais. Ela é responsável pela realização de simpósios. As universidades que têm essa é, graduação em geofísica, a sociedade patrocina uma semana de geofísica com recurso financeiro. Além disso, tem todo o aparato científico. Né? A sociedade lida com publicações de livros. Antes da sociedade, um profissional, para se atualizar no seu ramo de atividade, ele forçosamente teria que ir para o exterior, teria que frequentar congressos fora do país. Nós temos feito um trabalho de conscientização, principalmente dos jovens que estão nas escolas ainda, para que eles conheçam um pouco o que é a geofísica, para que é, a gente possa é ter um, um reconhecimento maior da sociedade da importância dessa atividade para o país. Estimular as novas gerações, desde as escolas, o ensino fundamental, o ensino universitário e os futuros profissionais que estão chegando aí. E tem lutas que a sociedade encampa, como por exemplo da regulamentação da carreira de geofísico. Temos trabalhado na regulamentação da profissão do geofísico, né? isso é algo importante. A sociedade ela tem alguns incentivos, benefícios que a gente chama pro associado. Mas eu acho que o essencial é o profissional se integrar à sociedade. No caso da prospecção mineral, que é a área que eu atuo, a geofísica tem sido muito importante porque você faz as investigações do subsolo sem cortar um galho. Você faz, passa com um avião. Os sensores geofísicos adquirem dados, né? E esses dados você não, não, não mexeu nada no meio ambiente. Com avanço tecnológico, desenvolvimento de instrumentos cada vez mais sensíveis para auscultar essa, esse planeta dinâmico, você tem condições de encontrar minerais, você encontra petróleo. Fomentar essa interação entre os grupos no país. É importante que é, nós, como profissionais, nós é, tenhamos uma representatividade e ela é feita através da sociedade brasileira. A geofísica cresce porque a sociedade está mudando, né? É, o planeta está mudando, a gente tem outras necessidades. A nossa geração e as gerações que estão vindo, eles têm um outro olhar para a Terra, como um ser, um organismo, que precisa ser cuidado. Com métodos físicos muito bem estruturados, com conhecimento muito grande, você tem condição de conseguir encontrar melhores jazidas, conseguir explorar melhor as jazidas que já existem. Se você olhar para dentro da sua casa, tudo que está lá veio, do, veio do, da terra, veio do subsolo. E, e para ser encontrado, teve, passou um trabalho de um geólogo, de um geofísico ou de um engenheiro de Minas. E isso...
Petrobras acredita em toda a tecnologia que aponte para um futuro melhor. Robôs que chegam em lugares impossíveis, a Petrobras tem. Supercomputadores e inteligência artificial com respostas instantâneas, também usamos. Realidade virtual para aumentar a eficiência, tudo isso está na Petrobras. Porque assim, com tanta inovação, seremos ainda melhores para você. Estudar a Terra e poder contar essa história e conhecer essa dinâmica é maravilhoso. A geofísica, de certa maneira, está no dia a dia das pessoas. O movimento que a Terra faz em torno do Sol, a variação de dia e noite, a maré, os tremores que ocorrem na Terra. À medida que está acontecendo um sismo, quais são essas implicações e o que vai acontecer? E a Terra emana essas forças. No Brasil, nós temos uma riqueza de recursos é, minerais, mas a gente não conhece ainda o que está mais de subsuperfície. Né? E isso aí é um campo inesgotável de pesquisa para aumentar a capacidade de riqueza da nação. Qualquer nação que tiver uma geofísica bem forte, ela vai desenvolver com mais qualidade o seu país. A sociedade nasceu para defender os interesses da comunidade geofísica brasileira, defender as instituições, defender os, os geofísicos e atuar junto aos órgãos de governo, seja para conseguir recursos financeiros, seja para é, até protestar contra arbitrariedades. A realidade brasileira na área de geofísica era uma outra realidade completamente diferente na medida em que se fazia geofísica ah, na Petrobras para exploração, ah, alguma coisa muito incipiente na área mineral e na área acadêmica ah, não havia sequer ainda um curso de pós-graduação em geofísica. O primeiro congresso que foi em 89 um grande grupo de geofísicos determinados né, a tornar a sociedade uma grande instituição e esse primeiro congresso foi o grande marco da SBGF. A Sociedade Brasileira de Geofísica ela atua fortemente no sentido de promover a geofísica no Brasil, então ela é responsável pela realização de congressos internacionais. Ela é responsável pela realização de simpósios. As universidades que têm essa é, graduação em geofísica, a sociedade patrocina uma semana de geofísica com recurso financeiro. Além disso, tem todo o aparato científico. Né? A sociedade lida com publicações de livros. Antes da sociedade, um profissional para se atualizar no seu ramo de atividade, ele forçosamente teria que ir para o exterior, teria que frequentar congressos fora do país. Nós temos feito um trabalho de conscientização, principalmente dos jovens que estão nas escolas ainda, para que eles conheçam um pouco o que é geofísica, para que é, a gente possa é ter um, um reconhecimento maior da sociedade da importância dessa atividade para o país. Estimular as novas gerações, desde as escolas, o ensino fundamental, o ensino universitário e os futuros profissionais que estão chegando aí. E tem lutas que a sociedade encampa, como por exemplo da regulamentação da carreira de geofísico. Temos trabalhado na regulamentação da profissão do geofísico, né? isso é algo importante. A sociedade ela tem alguns incentivos, benefícios que a gente chama para o associado. Mas eu acho que o essencial é o profissional se integrar à sociedade. No caso da prospecção mineral, que é a área que eu atuo, a geofísica tem sido muito importante porque você faz as investigações do subsolo sem cortar um galho. Você faz, passa com um avião, os sensores geofísicos adquirem dados né? e esses dados você não, não, não mexeu nada no meio ambiente. Com o avanço tecnológico, o desenvolvimento de instrumentos cada vez mais sensíveis para escutar 
essa, esse planeta dinâmico, você tem condições de encontrar minerais, você encontra petróleo. Fomentar essa interação entre os grupos no país. É importante que é, nós, como profissionais, nós é, tenhamos uma representatividade e ela é feita através da sociedade brasileira. A geofísica cresce porque a sociedade está mudando, né? É, o planeta está mudando, a gente tem outras necessidades. A nossa geração, as gerações que estão vindo, eles têm um outro olhar para a Terra, como um ser, um organismo, que precisa ser cuidado. Com métodos físicos muito bem estruturados, com conhecimento muito grande, você tem condição de conseguir encontrar melhores jazidas, conseguir explorar melhor as jazidas que já existem. Se você olhar para dentro da sua casa, tudo que está lá veio, do, veio do, da terra, veio do subsolo. E, e para ser encontrado, teve, passou um trabalho de um geólogo, de um geofísico ou de um engenheiro de Minas. E isso... A Petrobras acredita em toda a tecnologia que aponte para um futuro melhor. Robôs que chegam...